So hello world, um, are we on? We're on, okay, that's great. Um, very happy to be virtually here. And um, I'm very happy to see that there's quite a few Slido questions already, but also feel free to, um, I don't know, grab a microphone or something and ask me synchronous questions. Um, so the first question, interestingly, is what do I like and dislike about GitHub? Um, I think GitHub is great. Uh, I've been a GitHub user, uh, I think, since this first year. Um, and um, just today, actually, I saw GitHub on a um, government um, kind of uh, human right watch uh, because of a GitHub uh, repository called 996.icu. Uh, 996 uh, refers to the fact that many people um, working in uh, IT or engineering positions um, in uh, that the PRC are organizing uh, a kind of social movement uh, to kind of um, complain about uh, the regulated or kind of uh, industry regulated working condition that is 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and six days um, per week. Uh, and it's very interesting how GitHub has been home to many of such um, networked um, organizations to, to just start grassroots movements at a at this point, there's, I think, almost 200,000 uh, stars uh, and 14,000 forks and so on. And so this really is uh, grassroots. So I think it's, it's what I like GitHub most, is anyone can start a decentralized social movement uh, powered by GitHub page and the GitHub's decentralized uh, storage. Um, I don't have any gripes about GitHub right now. Um, when, when I used to work with Apple, we also used GitHub Enterprise. Uh, I remember at the time GitHub was uh, still kind of adjusting uh, from being a uh, public facing uh, public repository, mostly um, you know, framework for, for uh, development and slowly migrating to, to enterprise. But I think uh, GitHub is getting this balance pretty good right now. And now with um, Microsoft help, um, I, I wish GitHub all the best uh, in uh, developing a nuanced and balanced uh, governance model that takes into account both the um, you know, needs of uh, decentralized and multi-centralized uh, organizations as well as traditional enterprises. Um, two people would like to know, um, artificial superintelligence is arguably the greatest existential risk our species has ever faced. What safety measures do you think can be implemented? Um, I visited uh, OpenAI folks, um, I think a year or so ago, while they're still working on the Open Air Charter. Um, I think um, Charter, of course, is a very good uh, starting point, but what is even more important is just to get anybody who can get their hands on AI, which is pretty much anyone nowadays, um, some basic safety and bias and ethics um, understanding. Some of them is like really trivial, but uh, if you point them out early on, uh, they tend to be ingrained uh, into their thinking. Um, I often make a analogy to, to fire, right? You know, fire was also one of the uh, greatest existential risk our species ever discovered. Um, it has burned entire cities and it has caused catastrophes. But a way that a society uh, adapts with fire is not um, to, to ban the use of fire or to restrict the use of fire to priests uh, or people of a certain um, class, but rather to, to start teaching cooking as early as possible and with all the responsibility and all the dangerous precautions and so on uh, centered around cooking and, and indeed making cooking part of our culture and making sure that anyone can cook, have access um, to fire, but also with all the traditions and cultures and precautions. And as I think democratizing uh, AI at this point um, democratizing the uh, conversations about uh, deep learning and other technologies, I think is our best bet in making sure that there's uh, no, you know, isolated random person uh, just getting a hold on artificial superintelligence and do something that runs contrary to the ethics. And that is why we have the social innovation lab, we have the self-driving tricycles, we have the co-regulated norms and so on that uh, weaves uh, this AI into the society's fabric instead of the other way around. If we get into the habit of the other way around, that is to say adapting the society to fit uh, the random new AI technology, then we walk the path of uh, our existential threat of having the artificial superintelligence kind of dictate the social life and the norms. 
Um, one person want me to tell about Bitcoin story. There's not much story to tell. Uh, I'm not Satoshi. Uh, and uh, what I did was I think uh, around Bitcoin was not even 100 USD. Um, I started experimenting uh, to tell all my clients that was really early that I'm charging one Bitcoin per hour. I think uh, when I uh, started working with Apple, that's 2011 or so, uh, Bitcoin is at 200. Uh, and then uh, gradually it, it began to, to rise. Um, but all of my clients said, hey, our, our accounting system is not yet set up to accommodate cri cryptocurrency. Uh, and so we had to convert to fiat uh, on whatever um, the running price of Bitcoin is. So I never actually received Bitcoin, you see. Um, but I um, have a kind of growing uh, consultation rate <laughs> around that, that period of time. Uh, and I think uh, what I did was mostly uh, raising the awareness that there is a, a valid and visible um, and legitimate, really, uh, paying uh, way to um, accommodate for, um, you know, transactions across different jurisdictions and so on, which, again, is still Bitcoin's main value uh, at the moment. And so there, there's not much story. There's just a very, very early adopter and trying to lend some legitimacy uh, to this uh, crypto uh, invention. Um, three people would like to know, do I believe crypto is going to stay for a long run or is the volatile nature of it ultimately going to kill this as a currency? Well, first of all, um, I, I usually say distributed ledger technology or DLT. Uh, in Taiwan, we're seeing DLTs being used uh, a lot of different ways to, uh, from tracking, you know, uh, giving accountability to crowdfunded projects that works across jurisdictions uh, to ensuring that a contract and migrant workers signed uh, before they leave. Their home country is the same contract that they receive uh, when they uh, land to Taiwan or the citizens initiated air quality measurement devices cannot be uh, you know, changed in its numbers uh, when processed by our national uh, supercomputing center um, and, and so on and so forth. And so as a trust machine, I think it's already proven its worth uh, in getting everybody agree on a common ledger. Uh, whether it uh, works as a currency or on, um, or not, uh, depending on how you know tolerable you are uh, to the current crypto systems uh, limitations. Uh, I have many good friends working on uh, you know making those limitations go away or at least substantially uh, reducing the limitations. So I think we're too early to tell. Uh, any particular technology um, is going to to you know uh, serve as a currency or not. We're more like in still in the you know archy days of protocol rather than the HTTPS days of protocol. So it will still take a few years uh, to for the um, market and the society to to adapt uh, DLTs to various currencies. I think uh, we can start with um, the. Um, what we call uh, good exchange, the exchange of socially recognized goods uh, like time bank and so on uh, that are not directly competing uh, with the already very well, um, you know, uh, developed systems like, like Visa or MasterCard, uh, but rather to uh, get into the uh, places where uh, people don't usually uh, track their time bank um, credits and things like that. So there's some intermediate forms of currency that's just above uh, distributed ledger technology purely for accountability, but not yet um, everyday uh, payments currency. That's my take on this question. Um, two people would like to know, do you, I consider the idea of a government regulated social credit and advancement of technology in the public sphere or rather a tool of censorship and control? To which my answer is yes. It's both an advancement of technology in the public sphere and a tool of censorship and control. Uh, I mean, um, these two sounds like, you know, one is a good thing, one is a bad thing, but they're actually just, you know, orthogonal, right? You, you can uh, grow a technology uh, while at a um, same time limit access and control and governance to the technology to basically exclude uh, large swaths of people just by nature of keeping the um, you know back end of this technology uh, proprietary and closed and and rather secret uh, and protected by law I mean we've seen many technologies going through this um, um, I would say allure <laughs> or, or this kind of uh, shape before democratizing or open sourced or um, released uh, to the public and for the public to govern. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't expect that all the uh, social credit system will eventually get decentralized the same way that uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum has, but I think some way to uh, ascertain 
its legitimacy is critical. Um, at some point, if the social credit system uh, builds uh, purely on coercive power, then the legitimacy is rather low and people will see uh, for what it is. It is just another command and control system or co coercion and control system. And so for such technologies to truly grow, I think some sort of decentralized governance uh, is is very much needed. Um, that's actually at the, when Vitalik uh, visited Taiwan, uh, I think three years ago now, uh, we, we talk about the bus factor uh, of Ethereum, the DAO fork, and so on. And um, I, I came up with this analogy. It's like DAO fork is like the climate change of Ethereum that forces Vitalik to think about governance and th uh, about the legitimacy theory beyond his own um, kind of benevolent uh, dictator control. And so any technology that has such a social dimension need to go through such a um, you know, regulatory or governance change. He eventually would uh, work with Wayne Wild to come up with quadratic voting um, as one way to uh, you know, walk out of the uh, minefield that is um, you know, despotism versus uh, direct democracy. And I think QV is one of the very interesting projects that has the uh, potential to let people to have a uh, decentralized control. And that is also the voting system we're using in the uh, presidential hackathon this year. Um, two people would like to know what's my best advice for a college student. Um, my advice is, um, I think just a, a line of poem, uh, it's from Leonard Cohen. Uh, it says, uh, there is a crack in everything and that is how the light gets in. Um, what, what I mean by this is that it's very easy for college students uh, to see the world with a pair of new eyes and see all the social injustices, all the uncertainties, and all the non-democratic uh, places in the world. But those cracks are actually, mm, let it not be a way uh, to just pull you in, but rather let it be a gap uh, to, for you to identify, but for the light to come uh, all across the world because the great promise of the internet in general but github in particular uh, is that whatever um, your the thing you care about there's thousands of people caring about it uh, the same thing across the world and so um, learn to organize and to identify the social injustice or uncertainty or non-democratic uh, governance uh, spots and then organize around it and increase the buzz factor is my advice uh, two people would like to know, some people consider hackathons, promotional events of binge coding with no real impact. Do I think there is a value in attending and organizing hackathons? So the presidential hackathon is not just one hackathon. It is rather a series of hackathons. Um, we have like five hackathons distributed over three months uh, precisely to work on the continuity problem of hackathons. Because as you can see, the prize of our presidential hackathon is our presidential guarantee that the five winning teams will get their ideas implemented in our Taiwan's public service in the next nine months after three months of co-creation. And so in a sense, um, that prize is social impact and uh, the real work actually begins right after the hackathon. And people who don't even win the hackathon uh, can still join the five winning teams in making sure that the visions the five teams outlined um, in their presidential hackathon end up being the, the everyday reality. Uh, so far, we're five out of five. All the five winning ideas of the last year now has become uh, reality. And so I think just like any crowdsourcing or participatory event, the accountability, like what happens after the hackathon, is even more important than the transparency or participatory nature of it. So having some kind of way to, to bind uh, the hackathon's results into measurable or at least qualitatively uh, measurable um, outcomes, I think is, is very important. The more um, binding power, the more accountable uh, this part is, I think the, the more value uh, is uh, in the hackathon. Of course, there's still the, you know, the HR value in getting um, you know, people of like-minded nature and share a, a problem together and so on. I think that part is, is for sure. But I think uh, for the organizers, uh, I would suggest to look into large-scale hackathons like the Vatican hackathon or the presidential hackathon of Taiwan and so on and figure out a way to bind the results uh, into uh, measurable outcomes. Six people would like to know, Silicon Valley, one of the most richest places on Earth, cannot solve homelessness problem. What do I think will be an ideal solution to solve Silicon Valley's homelessness problem? 
Um, I, I don't uh, comment on things that I don't personally know, uh, but I, I think a really good uh, starting point is to, uh, as we say, uh, empower people uh, closest uh, to the suffering, meaning that uh, if it is uh, possible to understand the homelessness problem from the angle of the social workers, of the people who are homeless themselves, um, instead of a top-down way, uh, a top-down planning way, uh, to do more ethnographic research, to do more co-creation events with the people themselves, I think uh, that will give a much more clear picture of what uh, exactly is needed uh, for interventions. And sometimes uh, the solution takes decades, while uh, one of the you know, weakness in a representational democracy is that people would often want to focus on things that will you know, take effect in two years or in four years. And so some non-governmental, um, like long running um, social enterprise or um, NGO or whatever um, is uh, critical because it will uh, live throughout uh, the many uh, representational um, councils and so on, uh, and uh, be able to charter out a 10 year or 20 year journey uh, that can collectively uh, realize the solution of homelessness problems. Um, and so that again, I think is why SDGs uh, is timed at a horizon of around uh, 2030, is that um, we don't overfocus on short term uh, low hanging fruits, but rather uh, to plan together on getting the economic and the social and the environmental part of any given problem um, in a, a 10 year or so planning horizon. Four years, uh, four people is very interesting uh, about the presidential hackathon. How could I get government agreement uh, and how long did it take? Um, Truth to be told, uh, a smaller scale like municipal um, hackathon uh, of this kind of three months co-creation has already been piloted, uh, I think, around 2016 um, by the D4SG, the Data for Social Group group, uh, in the Taipei City as well as in New Taipei City. And so I think some kind of um, what we call devolution uh, to making sure that each city uh, has the um, um, budget, the funding, the uh, citywide regulatory support uh, for this kind of events is, is paramount because then at a presidential stage, we can just uh, look at what has obviously worked and what has fostered um, you know, cross-sectoral um, interaction and basically having the cities or the regions as the pilot sites uh, that we can then amplify this model. And so it, it, it really didn't uh, take much convincing because everybody um, who has any um, knowledge of the D4SG pilots or the Gov Zero uh, grants and so on uh, can see that it's obviously successes. And so when we uh, merge the Gov Zero grants on one side and the D4SG pilot program, the Data Hero program on the other side into the presidential hackathon, asking the people who have been running the two shows as mentors and steering committee, uh, people generally say, oh yeah, obviously it will work because it has worked. And so just having some sandboxes, I think is very important in proving the ideas because everybody will then have a smaller scale of first-hand experiences of your new social innovation. Two people would like to know technology can go in both the directions of centralization and decentralization, both of which have their pros and cons, which would I see uh, rather see as more common. So uh, it's interesting that we're now anthropomorphizing technology as if it's a uh, human being, uh, as if it can uh, go in directions. Uh, but actually, technology is just a vehicle upon which the uh, human societies uh, move in our directions, sometimes literally. So um, I think um, what we need to look at is not one particular technology like the web. Of course, the web has been, you know, decentralized, re-centralized, de-re-centralized, re-decentralized, and so on for many different iterations now. But I think what we need to pay attention is that people who are web developers, people who develop browsers, people who de develop servers, people who uh, develop web applications, people who build on the web what platform, uh, what are their, um, what we call regulative ideas, what are their internal metaphors uh, about the web. I think that is what we need to pay attention to. If people generally feel that the web um, brings people together, brings ideas together uh, in a way that respects their autonomy, uh, their what we call data agency, their um, or data collaboratives, if we see ourselves as stewards, uh, not controllers of data, that the words matter, 
uh, then uh, even if we use centralized technologies, uh, we can deploy it in a way that guarantees autonomy and transparency and accountability. While on the other hand, any decentralized technology have the potential, um, just like you know, distributed ledger, it can very easily uh, be reshaped into a you know uh, just centralized control uh, layer if the people uh, designing the system uh, decide that they should hoard uh, the power uh, and use um, the metaphors. Um, that are in, in corresponding to such a worldview. And so I think regulative ideas really matter and the words that we use matters. Uh, and which is why I make sure to always use, you know, like the prayer, <laughs> the, the internet of beings, data collaboratives and things like that. Um, I think people can move and people's mind can move. Technology only in views uh, where our minds move. Uh, four people would like to uh, see me sharing a interesting uh, side project that I'm working on. This is a great question. Um, so I've been working on the MOE dictionary, that is the MOE dictionary as my side project, kind of very long running side project um, for, for many, many years now, since 2013. It's called MOE Dict. Uh, and the MOE dictionary is significant because Taiwan is uh, of many cultural heritages. Uh, we have of course, the indigenous languages such as Amis uh, and the Adaya and so on. There are 16 different languages. We have the um, Taiwanese Holo, Taiwanese Hakka, Taiwanese Mandarin, and uh, many other languages. Uh, of course, we also have a sizable expat uh, and also uh, new migrants, which all bring their own culture and languages. And Moedic strives to be a general purpose um, learning tool for people who uh, you know, are second language uh, learners here, or for people who are of around seven years old to nine years old, uh, to get into the habit of checking into each other's cultures and learning the common roots, for example, the common Austronesian roots of the Taiwanese uh, indigenous languages, or the common roots of the Taiwanese Holo Hakai Mandarin languages. Uh, and so instead of on different websites, we design an integrated experience where people can easily share the um, calligraphies and things like that, or free phones and so on uh, on social media uh, to get into the habits of co-creating the, the dictionary. Moedict has many spawn uh, projects like the Aidagi project, which is basically urban dictionary for Taiwanese Holo. And many people can bring new terms like the Pokemons and so on and get a crowdsourced translation for it into the Daigi, uh, into Taiwanese Holo and ba basically keeping the language up to date uh, to the latest terminologies and so on and build language circles around it. So that's my favorite uh, side project. It's completely under Creative Commons Zero, that is to say public domain. Uh, and we are very happy to see many language communities just forking it uh, and supporting the indigenous language uh, movements and so on. Um, three people would like to know, and I think that may be the last question because we have uh, two minutes left. If I'm designing an AI to replace myself, what would be the most difficult part? Uh, well, I, I don't have a self, truth to be told. <laughs> um, I have uh, a, a base um, kind of uh, horizon. Um, I, I fall into sleep every night, uh, completing, uh, replying to all the mails, um, zeroing the inbox and making sure that the Pomodoro, uh, you know, um, ideas are met uh, and uh, uh, all the remaining transcripts or whatever can be published. I push them to GitHub, uh, which is then automatically published to our PDIS website. And so I make sure that um, all the artifacts that I create uh, during the day uh, is pushed out um, around the night so I can fall asleep with a uh, kind of no legacy code <laughs> and wake up uh, deciding that it, it may be time to do something new, to be uh, doing something creative instead of being held hostage uh, by myself of yesterday. Uh, and so if I'm to design an uh, AI, I think one of the most important thing is to make sure that it's not beholden um, to the utility functions uh, that it had uh, before um, the, any given time point, that it had a uh, clearly demarked uh, maybe day uh, or week uh, to reorganize itself, to reinvent itself, and to have a way to just um, talk across the world uh, to instead of treating people's values like instrumental values, treat them like 
um, the, the social values they are and co-create the common values and the sustainable development goals is a very good uh, anchor to that and to work gradually towards the common goals rather than the common direction because the common direction just like any bias um, can lose its relevance over time but the commonly shared goals the common goals given our different positions i think is one of the what we call coherent blended volition uh, that can guide um, human intelligence and AI uh, together into what we call extended or augmented uh, collective intelligence or, you know, ACI. And so I think that's uh, the entirety of my talk and we're hitting the allocated time. So thank you for so much for joining me and for the great questions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. Hope, hope you like the session.